by our Native Americans, they were also determined to limit and define. The bottom line is that the United States was determined not only to take the land previously settled by our Native Americans, they were also determined to limit and define where Indians could live in the new America. Between 1778, when the first treaty was signed by the Delawares, and 1868, when the final one was completed by the Nez Pierces, there was 365 ratified Indian treaties. And this brings us to Albert Pike. Regardless of how many titles we choose to place on Pike, he was first and foremost a lawyer. It was the occupation by which he made his living. As a young man, Pike had been to Indian territory many times. He loved to hunt there and became well acquainted with many of the tribal leaders through these many expeditions. He was particularly liked by the Creeks and Choctaws. And since there was hardly a single treaty of the 1830s era that was honored between the United States and the tribes, the tribal chiefs had many claims against the government. They went to Pike to represent them. He became a legend in Indian Territory for his recovery in March of 1859 of nearly $3 million for the Choctaw Nation in a dispute with the United States government. Most of the Indian claims related to the government's failure to pay the tribes and agreed upon amount for the land they gave up in the cessation treaties. Of course, we're talking about millions of acres with those transactions. The Creeks, for instance, own nearly all the land that is now Alabama and approximately half of the present state of Georgia. Regardless of the value per acre placed on this land, it represented nearly 31 million acres. The problem was that the leadership regularly changed in Washington, and one set of legislators were seldom willing to pay an amount that a previous set of lawmakers had agreed to. Secondly, the distances being so great between the two regions, or between Washington and Indian Territory, communication between the two regions were never quick in coming. This led to constant confusion over how much money was promised where and when it could be expected to be paid. Finally, lawmakers often used legal tactics to avoid facing the terms of the old agreements. agreements. The result was that government debts were generally only partially paid and were always being revalued in amount. Pike spent a good deal of time in Washington convincing the Congress that there was no statute of limitations on tribal treaties. In fact, in representing the tribes, he attended every session of the Congress between 1852 and 1861. He also served the Chickasaw Nation in claims filed against the government. In 1854, he was made the sole attorney of the Choctaw Nation. He wrote the Declaration of Independence for the Cherokee Nation. During this time, he also compiled a lengthy vocabulary of the dialects of some 15 tribes in Indian Territory, a manuscript totaling 129 pages and covering nouns and verb forms written out phonetically in columns against their English equivalents. He turned this work over to the Smithsonian, who subsequently loaned it to someone else who attempted to publish it. Pike intervened just in time to rightfully claim it was his. It later became the property of the Supreme Council and has still never been published. Pike was also responsible for writing treaties between nations within Indian territory that define the geographic boundaries of each tribal government. He created the Seminole Nation as a separate and independent tribe from the Creek Nation. All of these treaties he then took to Washington for ratification. He was, in a word, the principal counsel for the establishment of the governments of Indian territory. This brings us to mastery in Indian territory. I mentioned earlier that a number of Indian chiefs and other leaders had received Masonic degrees in Washington, D.C. while they're on official business. Many of them were a number of officers and enlisted men in the Army who escorted them to Indian Territory were members of the craft. The result was that the history of the Indian Territory and of Freemasonry in Oklahoma is so closely interwoven with that of the five civilized tribes, it would be difficult to entirely separate them. While it cannot be proven that masonry had any effect on any treaties or legal reconciliations within the territory, 
it is certain that the fraternal associations between white men and tribal leaders living in the territory, Albert Pike included, had a lot to do with bringing about a more orderly period of transition. We know, for instance, that William Ross, a Cherokee chieftain, was raised a master mason in 1848 in Federal Lodge while in Washington, D.C., to arrange a treaty for the removal of Cherokees from Georgia to the territory. It turned out this important treaty was an achievement of master masons whose lodge membership, for the most part, was Alexandria, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. This process of brotherly affiliation in the territory was also partially facilitated by the many ministers, merchants, and military personnel who were also members of the craft. These early traders, educators, and Christian leaders began early on to hold informal social meetings with the tribal leaders, got acquainted with their families, and brought them into the fraternal care of the lodges. This is evidenced by applications of authority to organize the first lodges in various locations in the territory, which I will now mention. Among Masons who played important roles were John and William P. Ross, Cherokee chiefs, David Carter, Supreme Court Justice, Push Mataha, Choctaw philosopher and patriot, Peter Pitchlin and Alan Wright, Choctaw chiefs, John Jumper, Seminole warrior and chief, and Opate Lehoya, chief of the Creek Nation. Before 1848, the nearest Masonic Lodge was in Fort Smith, Arkansas. The Indian brothers were determined to found a lodge of their own in the territory. They made a request to the brothers at nearby Fort Gibson to petition the Grand Lodge of Arkansas to establish a lodge at Tahlequah, seat of the Cherokee Nation. The charter for Cherokee Lodge No. 21, Cherokee Nation, was granted on November 9, 1848. While both Indians and white men were install, uh, organized the lodge, the leaders were Indians. The first officers were installed in the Cherokee Supreme Court building on July 12, 1849. It was, un, uh, it was of unusual interest to all Freemasons in that it was the first lodge of Masons ever established among the North American Indians. The first master was Walter Scott Adair, a leader in the, polit the political affairs of the Cherokees in Georgia before removing to the territory. Both wardens were tribal leaders. William Cudi, the son of the Lodge's senior warden, Joseph Cudi, wrote the first constitution for the Cherokee Nation in 1837. He was buried with Masonic honors in Washington, D.C., with a funeral procession down Pennsylvania Avenue, led by the United States Marine Band. William Ross, nephew of Chief John Ross, also an active Freemason, was the secretary of the Lodge. He was a graduate of Princeton and arrived in Indian Territory in 1842. He was elected clerk of the Senate of the Cherokee National Council in 1843 and would be elected chief of the Cherokees in 1872. David Carter, treasurer of the lodge, was editor of the Cherokee Advocate. He was a judge at Tahlequah and was elected chief justice of the Supreme Court in 1851. In 1852, the Cherokee National Council, under the recommendations of John Ross, meeting in session in Tahlequah, donated two lots in the town of Tahlequah on condition that a building be erected on these lots within two years for the purpose of housing both a Masonic Lodge and the Sons of Temperance. The lodge occupied the second story. It was the first Masonically owned building in Indian Territory. The second lodge erected was Fort Gibson Lodge No. 35, chartered in 1850. This lodge was established especially for the United States officers and soldiers stationed at Fort Gibson near Dokesville. The success of the first two lodges encouraged the Choctaws then to establish their own lodge at Dokesville in 1852. Membership included such illustrious names as Chief Sam Ga Ga Gavin and Chief Basil LaFleur. The Grand Master of Arkansas made a visit to Dokesville in 1871 and wrote in his report that he had found many intelligent Freemasons among the Indians and their lodge was eloquently furnished. The fourth lodge was Flint Lodge, number 74, chartered in 1853 at Flint, sometimes referred to as the Flint Station in the Cherokee Nation. All these lodges were composed mainly of Cherokee and Choctaw citizens. Supreme Court Judge George W. Steitem of the Creek Nation, one of Pike's closest friends, led the movement to establish a lodge for his people. 
He and Ben Marshall, Creek National Treasurer, obtained a charter from Muskogee Lodge, number 93, in November 1855. It was located at the town of the Creek Agency. Judge Steidem served as the first master. Membership included past Creek Chief Samuel Chakota, Kasutha Yarhola, National Attorney for the Creek Nation, and William McCombs, who served 11 years in the Creek House of Warriors and later founded Bacon College. All of these lodges remained active until the Civil War, where membership became scattered, records were lost, per capita taxes were unpaid to the, United, to the Grand Lodge of Arkansas, and Union and Confederate factions made it difficult for masonry to prevail. As unfortunate it is to say, because of the loss of the original charters and the historic names upon them, in our own Oklahoma Masonic history, we find we've essentially had to start all over after the Civil War with the reconstituting and renaming of new lodges. But the Native American position during the Civil War is a fascinating story itself. Albert Pike and the tribal chiefs were right in the middle of how things played out militarily. In the years between 1856 and 1860, Pike was torn between his love of the Union and his love for the South. He wrote brilliant treatises on the sovereign authority of states, arguing that the Constitution was a compact made up of distinct people in each of the tribes, that the government was, uh, was thus created was a corporation entitled the United States, that this corporation held in law the legal title to the territories, but that in fact the territories were the joint property of the states that a citizen of a state removing to a territory remained a citizen of the state where he came, from whence he came, that no territory possessed a sovereignty or power to legislate upon any topic with the exception of those powers specifically granted to its legislature, legislature by the states assembled in Congress. But he was also strongly opposed to the secessionist movement, stating that loyalty to the Union only requires that one vindicate the Constitution. Those who would march against the Union by assailing the Constitution should have no allies. He also believed the states had a constitutional right to succeed when grave to secede when grave violations of the Constitution made it impossible to maintain the Union. He went back and forth with the Democratic Party on issues of state rights and union preservation until his own Arkansas seceded. And with Arkansas and the Confederacy, Pike felt he had no choice but to turn his attention to securing Indian territory for the Confederate States. This was done under the provisional government of the Confederate States. It created a Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1861. Jefferson Davis knew of Pike's influence with the Creeks and Choctaws and named him Commissioner of the Confederate States of the Indians west of Arkansas. His job was to induce the tribes to join the Confederacy, and generally speaking, the tribes were sympathizers with the Southern cause. They had come from the Deep South, most owned slaves, the government had been the cause of their being forced to move, usually during the cold of winter, causing many deaths. There was, in fact, much resentment, resentment toward the United States among the Indian people. Still, there were Indian leaders who believed it smart to remain loyal to the government. Their people depended upon the terms of prior and subsequent treaties. Opethelehola, chief of the Creeks, and John Ross, chief of the Cherokees, knew of the gravity of their situation. Throughout the conflict, they would play the game of allies to both sides so as to secure the best terms for their people, regardless of the outcome. As for Pike, he knew he could not secure support of the Confederacy without financial obligations to the tribes. He knew the Indians would back the Confederacy in a war against the United States only if their political and civil rights were guaranteed by new treaties. Even though he had no sanction to do so, he spent the next year negotiating individual treaties with the Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Seminoles, Cherokees, Comanche, Osage, Seneca, Shawnees, and Quapaws. He was even able to get Ross and Opethelehoya to sign on in behalf of their nations. Although both steadfastly stood on their convictions to remain neutral to the conflict to the extent possible, they permitted Trike Pike to raise a regiment for Confederate service in Indian territory 
in exchange for independent governance after the war. Pike also guaranteed the Confederate States would pay the tribes for any Indian nation land lost during the conflict. In the meantime, Pike had also signed treaties with the Wichita, Seminoles, and Cherokees. By December 1861, Indian Territory had submitted to the Confederacy and joined in the war against the Union. Pike was commissioned a brigadier general in the Army of the Confederate States to command the Indian troops raised under his treaties. He got all the treaties ratified in Congress and would likely have retired a valiant hero of the war had a political catastrophe not struck him immediately after the only battle he ever engaged in during the conflict. The battle took place at Pea Ridge outside of Bentonville, Arkansas. It involved Pike's troops of Choctaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, along with the troops of two other Confederate generals, Price and Van Dorn. The Confederate forces were defeated in the battle, but not because of any actions of Pike. The loss itself was not the problem. The problem was that Pike had made a tactical error as a leader. He forgot to tell his Indian troops of the established rules of conduct in battle. Instead, the Indians did what their own traditions of war called for, They simply scalped the northern troops they shot. Pike was angry and disgusted by the action and immediately issued a special order to the troops of his department that the barbarous and wanton killing of wounded men and the scalping of dead men was reprehensible and we would be from that point forbidden. He court-martialed one soldier for shooting a wounded Federal. Of course, his actions and sentiments didn't make any difference. As soon as word got back to the North, The Northeast press made Pike out to be a ruthless American who had induced hordes of savages to butcher brave countrymen who had done nothing more than take up arms to prevent the subversion of the Republic. Pike would never fully overcome the public embarrassment over the conduct of his Confederate troops at Pea Ridge and regretted the action the remaining of his days. In the end, the fine promises made to the Indians by Pike came to nothing. The Confederacy was unable to live up to to its treaties. Refugee Indians with Union sentiments played havoc with the political reorganization of the tribes. The tribes themselves, having renounced their old treaty obligations with the United States and taken up arms against the North, faced a country intent on dealing strongly with such wayward and rebellious action. Congress seldom acknowledged claims made by the tribes or authorized the distribution of funds granted by any of the pre-war treaties. They were fortunate the government did not consolidate all the tribes and establish a territorial government for Indian territory. 